This famous academy is a thousand years old. Although now empty, it still seems to echo to the recitation of the classics. Originally built as private lecture halls or Buddhist or Taoist monasteries, such academies became important educational institutions as government schools declined. Confucian scholars boarded and studied in them. As non-government institutions enjoying greater academic freedom, they became birthplaces of new ideas. Why did so many such academies flourish during the Northern and Southern Song dynasties? What did these influential academies have to do with the emergence of Neo-Confucianism at that time? On the first day of 960, a coup at Chen Bridge on the northern bank of the Yellow River changed the course of Chinese history. Draped in an imperial yellow robe by his supporters, Zhao Kuan Ying, Grand Commander of the Palace Guards, led his troops back to Kaifeng, capital of the later Zhou Dynasty, and forced Emperor Gung to abdicate. No blood was shed during the transfer of power. To ensure political stability, the new Song dynasty used every possible means to restrict the power of the military. The incorporation of such thinking into the old ancestral laws and institutions produced a conservative bureaucratic class. Intellectuals still mostly followed the conventions of the Han and Tang dynasties, while official learning in the early Song consisted mainly of commentaries on ancient works. Books such as the standard interpretation of the five Confucian classics remained official textbooks. Both government education and the recruitment of officials were based on these books. However, a far-reaching measure would change this stifling system. The Song emphasized meritocracy over military prowess and boosted social morale. The Song Chao's king is that 文官哪怕几十个，他的做一些贪污腐败的事情，也抵不上一个武将叛乱带来的这个祸害。另外一个，文官有一个好处，文官是通过这个儒家的这种学术的学习，进入到这个官僚系统的。他们有这个价值理想，他们尊崇儒家，比如说这个，呃，纲常明教啊，这个对于社会秩序的建构。By the mid-Northern Song, most high officials at court were scholars selected through imperial examinations, a development that would have far-reaching consequences. In 1057, while grading examination papers, the author and statesman Ouyang Shou read a fluent and well-reasoned essay. After thinking it over, he ranked it second. He would have ranked it first, but he thought that his student Sung Gong had written it, and he wanted to avoid being accused of favoritism. The essay turned out to have been written by another scholar, Su She. Su She, his brother Su Zhe, and Sung Gong all graduated in the same year. They would shine like stars over the political landscape of Northern Song. The Yongjia Mausoleum of Emperor Ren Song was restored in the 1990s. And Song is regarded as a paragon among emperors. In his reign, talented men served the imperial court, and civil officials enjoyed unprecedented status. Later generations nostalgically recalled the emperor and scholar officials ruled together. During his reign, other talented young graduates, such as Han Qi, Fu Bi, or Yang Shou, Lao Jing, Wang Anshu and Sir Ma Guang would be the backbone of Sung's highly competent public administration. For these scholar officials, Confucian morality and political ethics were paramount. Reputation and integrity mattered. Some courageously pursued political reform and became the mainstays of Confucian revitalization. This is to say that Sung is a kind of 呃，不杀士大夫，不不杀大臣和严事官，啊、呃，来
嗯，士大夫呢也在实行一种，呃，士大夫和皇帝共治天下，呃，这样的一种呃思想吧，和呃，对于宋代社会的发展，我认为还是呃，对于宋代社会的发展，对宋代一些改革啊、呃，还是起了很大的作用。如果没有一个士大夫，他的这种主体的意识啊、呃，他的忧患的意识，他的担当的精神，嗯，那他就不可能像。呃，范仲淹像王安石，呃，那么积极主动的提出来这样的一个改革的措施。This renewal is known as Neo-Confucianism or Song Shui, Song Learning. Instead of the commentarial approach of the Han and Tang, Song scholars brought their own understanding and interpretation to bear upon the classics. 啊，比如说李对这句话怎么理解？我怎么怎么解释？那么他对这句话怎么理解，又怎么解释？啊，没有自己这个一些学者的主观的一些东西。那么到北宋开始，那这些呢著书呢，呃，由于有一些这个文化伟人啊，他们呢这个就不断的。加上了自己的一些东西。This reinvigoration had its roots in the mid and late Tang Dynasty. In the origin of Tao, Han Yu had opposed both Buddhism and Taoism. He had advocated the revival of the Confucian tradition, hoping to restore it as the orthodox philosophy. However, his views and those of Liu Songyuan attracted little attention at the time. While he supported Buddhism and Taoism, Emperor Junsung vigorously promoted Confucianism. Under Emperor Rinsung, its supremacy was established by the imperial examinations, private academies, and the search for new philosophical frameworks furthered the movement. With the rise of Neo-Confucianism, the scholar officials also redefined their mission. They considered how the classics could provide practical guidance to serve the nation and its people. The Qing Li reforms of 1043 to 1045 were one such attempt to introduce beneficial social changes. Liu Yangxiu is a Taoist monk. He praises these things. For the Rui Zhong, the Taoist monk, he is very respectful. But he has this strong devotion to truth. This is contrasting with the Song Dynasty style. 呃，学习研究所导致的这样一种求真的这种倾向有关。Hu Yuan, a commoner recommended by Fan Zhongyan, was invited to examine and revise the ceremonial and ritual music of the imperial court and temples. He later presided over the imperial academy. Hu Yuan was born in Taizhou, in what is now Jiangsu Province. On the recommendation of Fan Junyan and Tang Zijing, he directed prefectural government schools and undertook academic research and teaching. He criticized the imperial examination system, arguing that learning should have practical outcomes. Uh, 命题答用这些，这关键是这个体用。呃，这是中国哲学史上一行一对非常重要的概念。甚至可以说是中国传统哲学的一个典型形态，叫体用论。但是胡元讲的体用呢，实际上是以，呃，纲常明教为体，以经世之用为用。所以他的这，呃，他的学生给他总结的叫，呃，有体有用有学。Hu Yuan's prefectural schools in Suzhou and Huzhou. Taught both the Confucian classics and their practical application in the service to the nation. They emphasize studiousness, honesty, sincerity, and gentleness. Thousands of students graduated over the more than two decades of Hu's teaching career. Hu Yuan in Song Dynasty Rui History's contribution is mainly in the Rui Dynasty education level. 他是受最初是受地方官的支持，比如说像范仲淹这些人的支持，比如说在湖州、苏州办学，取得了非常好的这个社会效果
，然后到中央的太学来当这个主管的这个老师，他把他的那一套呢应用到这个中央到地方的这种学校教育当中。Collectively known as the three early Song masters, Hu Yuan, Zhong Fu, and Shao Jie, were trailblazers for Neo-Confucianism. However, conservative ministers quashed the Qingli reforms. Fan Zhongyan was demoted to a regional post, as was Ouyang Shou for supporting him. In Chuzhou, Ouyang Shou wrote his Account of the Drunkard's Pavilion, a masterpiece of the classical prose movement. So they wanted to use a different kind of language, like using the Qingli language, the Qingli language, the Qingli language, the Qingli language, 来表达自己的那样一种不同于骈体文那种贵族，呃，宫廷情趣的一种新的思想感情、新的价值取向。那么，他们采用古文这种形式。Ouyang Shou also played a significant role in the Song reinterpretation of the Confucian classics. He was one of the first to query the tradition of Confucian commentary. The Song Dynasty arose out of the political disunity of the Five Dynasties period that followed the collapse of the Tang. In order to keep such a tragedy from happening again and to ensure its own predominance, the Song emphasized the ancient theme of revering the monarch to repel the barbarians. This helped pave the way for the revival of Confucianism. In 1068. Emperor Shen Song appointed Wang Anshu as Chancellor. His Xin Fa or new policies were a multifaceted reform program. Two years later, poetry composition and rote recitation of the Confucian classics in the imperial examinations were replaced by interpretation and discussions of policy. Wang Anshu believed that good government must be modelled on that of the legendary sage emperors. Since the link to the sage emperors had been broken, Wang proposed establishing more official schools, teaching the interpretation of the classics, and reform of the imperial examination system. Confucian teachers would then be respected, and officials would be well versed in the Confucian classics and ancient governance. Better social customs would replace corruption and malpractice. In order that shared Confucian customs and ethics should prevail, and to cultivate a positive attitude toward reform, the Song Court issued Wang's "The New Meaning of the Three Classics" in 1073. This neo-Confucian commentary on the classics of poetry and history and the rites of Zhou aimed to facilitate the reforms. Wang Anshu's school of thought, the Jinggong New School, was an important development. 这个经义啊，成来之后，三经义成来之后，是通过朝廷的力量去颁行到全国。那么在这种情况下面，它很自然的就成为当时的这些诗人、读书人去读书的一个根据，同时科举考试的一个标准。Neo-Confucianism uses terms that defy adequate translation, such as xin xin. Roughly, nature of the heart, mind, or temperament. Xin Li, the principle of human nature, and Tian Da, the way of heaven or laws of nature. Traditional Confucianism prioritized ethical reflection, textual analysis, and empirical study. Song Confucians investigated what heart, mind, principle, and heaven's way meant, both metaphysically in terms of humanity's relationship with the cosmos, and in terms of Confucian orthodoxy. This new focus arose from long-term interactions between Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. Uh, I think Wang Anshu's this uh, reform, uh, including his, um. 儒学的这样一种发展，啊、呃，应该呃处于一个基本上一个肯定的这样这样一个地位<咳>，因为刚才说到了，呃，王安石的儒精工心学，哎、呃，它实际上是一种使五经四书
呃，这样经世致用的。I have no fear that clouds will obscure my vision, for I am standing on the very summit. These lines from a poem by Wang Anshu express his confidence in advocating the way of ancient sages over rigid observance of ancestral practice. His new policies aim to strengthen the nation and its army. Except briefly between 1086 and 1094, the new meaning of the three classics was the official and hence orthodox textbook for government schools and the imperial examinations. But state support lent Wang Anshu's new school a somewhat doctrinaire character. Scholars were required to study the new meaning. But few truly grasped its essence. Fewer still could put it into practice. Vicious attacks, fueled by factionalism, rained down both on Wang Anshu's new school and his reforms. During the 12th and 13th centuries under Southern Song, Wang Anshu's school was excoriated as unorthodox by followers of Li Shue, the school of principle sometimes called rationalists. But I love only the lotus, which arises from mud yet is not solid, makes ripples in the clear water, yet is not showy. These lines are from a short poetic essay on the love of the lotus by Zhou Duanyi, a Northern Song philosopher. Zhou Duanyi was born in Dao County in present-day Hunan. His father died when he was five, so he and his mother were taken in by his uncle Zhang Shang. He had always loved lotuses, so his uncle built a pavilion and lotus pond where Joe could study and muse. Perhaps Joe Duanyi's metaphor of the lotus as the Junzi, the noble person or gentleman, grew from his reflections by that very pond. His love is a kind of life in this world, and can be seen in this world. 世界的之外的另外一种精神的境界，所以呢，在周登仪的这个《爱莲书》里头，他表达了自己这么一种精神的追求。一方面就是要在这个世界里面去，呃，扎扎实实的做事情；另一方面又有比较高的一个精神的追求，所谓的去出污泥而不染。Zhou Duanyi was an important precursor of Neo-Confucianism. His best-known works are Tai Ji Tu Shui, or Explanation of the Diagram of the Supreme Ultimate, and Tong Shu, or Penetrating the I Ching. From the mid-11th century, Neo-Confucianism entered its second stage, turning from broad discussions to subtle analyses, from the pursuit and practical application of truth. To metaphysical deliberation and the understanding of Xin Xing, the nature of the human heart mind, from expressing manifold propositions to embracing set norms of thought. 那么太极图书为什么这么重要呢？实际上，它这里头，我觉得就奠定了理学的一个基本的理论的构架，尤其是成朱理学、朱熹理学的一个理论的构架。就在他这里头，首先呢，谈天地万物的这个本源本体，就是宇宙的本源是无极。然后呢，从无极开始呢，就谈到天地万物的形成生化，再谈到人，再谈到人的这个道德，再谈到人的修养。那么实际上就是把天和人贯通起来再讲了。Zhou Duanyi connected cosmology with human nature. The sage is the master of stillness, he wrote. With an unperturbed heart and mind, the sage correctly distinguishes good from evil in order to achieve the highest ethical ideal. Zhou's vision greatly advanced Confucianism. His propositions and categories were repeatedly debated and elaborated by later Li Shue or rationalist Neo-Confucian scholars. The tradition comes from Confucius and Mencius, they said. Da Shue or Neo-Confucianism begins with Zhou Duanyi. 
The transition from the doctrine of righteousness to the study of Xin Qing and Xin Li distinguished Song Confucianism from its Han and Tang predecessors. Be upright for the world's sake. Ensure the people's livelihood. Study the ancient sages earnestly. Foster peace for future generations. These four sentences of Mr. Hung Chu are by the Northern Song Neo Confucian Zhang Zhei. 现实的这种他 moved to Hangzhou, a town in modern Shanxi. His moniker, Hangzhou Shensheng, means teacher of Hangzhou, or more colloquially, Mr. Hangzhou. At the time, Sung was often at war with Western Sha, and he wanted to fight for Sung. At 21, he submitted nine notes on the frontier to Fan Zhongyan. <laughs> 就是根据宋代的这个记载有一种说法说张载是要找范仲淹要到这个西夏战场上去建功立业但是范仲淹就劝他就是读中庸好像说这个张载就是走上了这个新儒学的这样一种理论创造之路 on Feng's recommendation, Zhang Sei studied Confucian, Buddhist, and Taoist texts. More than a decade of research brought forth renowned works such as Rectifying Ignorance, Commentaries on the I Ching, and Treasury of Principles for the Study of the Classics. The Song may have lost a general, but it gained an influential scholar. Zhang Sei's Guan Shui School gave Neo-Confucianism a metaphysical and epistemological foundation. It played a significant role in promoting Confucian values in the Guangzhou region from which its name derives. Mr. Hung Chu's teachings attracted and inspired a generation of respected scholars. When the Northern Song scholar Yang She sought out one of his age's greatest philosophers, Zhang Yi, the master was having a nap. Young waited respectfully outside, in winter. Snow piles up at Chang Yi's door, has ever since referred to those with deep reverence for their master. Chang Hao and Chang Yi were two founders of Neo-Confucianism. Their school of thought was called Luo Shui, because they were born and later taught in Luo Yang. The Chang brothers' philosophy was influenced by both Zhou Junyi and Zhang Tse. When they were young, Zhou Junyi had served their father, Zhang Xiang. Impressed by Zhou's integrity and learning, he made Zhou his son's teacher. The brothers were ambitious to seek the truth. Zhang Tse was their second cousin. The three of them studied and discussed the principles of the I Ching together. 那么二陈是周敦颐的影响是很明显的就是他对这个宇宙整体论的这个理解对于人性和天理关系的理解包括这种信心修养的理论陈毅在泰学里面写了一篇叫这个呃言子所好和学论呃里面就是融合了胡元
Cheng Hao sought truth through intuition and feeling. He influenced Lu Jiu Yuan and Wan Yang Ming's Xin Shui, or School of Mind. Cheng Yi sought knowledge and internal illumination through the investigation of external things. Zhu Xi developed these ideas in the Li Shui, or School of Principle. Opposing Wang Anshu's reforms, Cheng Hao withdrew from politics. The Chang brothers studied further and taught their interpretation of the Confucian classics. Luo Xue, the school of Luo, developed in direct opposition to Wang Anshu's Jing Gong New School. Its influence grew as the Chang brothers' students spread its doctrines widely. During the Southern Song, almost every type of Neo-Confucianism could trace its lineage back to the school of Luo. These and other Song thinkers developed Neo-Confucian learning. But the master who would synthesize these various schools into a grand philosophy was waiting in the wings. The small pond gleams like a mirror, where sunlight and cloud shadows wander. I ask how it attains such shining clarity. From the living spring waters that feed it, this famous poem, Thoughts While Reading, was written by Zhu Xi in a free, natural, and refined style. Widely circulated, it encouraged people to strive to learn in quest of truth. Epitomizing the achievements of Sung Neo-Confucianism, Zhu Xi was the most important Confucian thinker since the master himself and Mencius. His comprehensive metaphysical system long dominated Chinese thought and politics. Although his family hailed from Wu Yuan in modern Jiangxi, Zhu Xi was born in Fujian province. He wrote prolifically throughout his long life and lectured mainly at Kaoting in Jianyang, northern Fujian. His school is known as either Min Shui, the school of Fujian, or as the Kaoting school. Zhu Xi established the genealogy of Neo-Confucianism in his treatise Origins of the School of Luo. According to Zhu Xi, the Chang brothers had restored the transmission of the Confucian Way, which had lapsed after the death of Mencius 1400 years earlier. Zhou Duanyi, honored as the Chang brothers' teacher, together with Zhang Tsai and Xiao Yong, comprised the five scholars of the Northern Song Dynasty, the genealogy's key figures. Changju Li Shue, the Changju Rationalist School, became the predominant ideology of late imperial China. Zhu Xi, ah, 关于礼器的研究成果啊，主要体现在八个字：啊，礼在器先，礼器合一。所谓礼，简单的说，通俗的说，就是一种思维，是一种意识，是一种概念性的东西。所谓器，就是物质。按朱熹理解呢，这个思维意识，或者说啊。这个是在物质的前面。这里按照马克思主义哲学去分析它，它肯定是是属于唯心的啊范畴。According to Zhu Xi, people should follow Tian Li, heaven's principle or the natural order, not human desires. He analyzed the three cardinal guides: ruler guides subject. Father guides son, and husband guides wife. In terms of Li and Qi, claiming that like the seasons, Tian Li made them so. Tian Li could also be elaborated into the five constant virtues: benevolence, righteousness, propriety, wisdom, and integrity, the pillars of Confucian conduct. Since 1241, the memorial tablets of Zhou Duanyi, the Chang brothers, Zhang Tsai. And Du Xi have resided in Confucian temples. During the Yuan Dynasty, Zhu Xi's commentaries on Confucian classics became the official texts for the imperial examinations. The state-endorsed Changju school of Neo-Confucianism became the official orthodoxy. In the lecture hall of the Yuelu Academy, 
Four panels display the characters for loyalty, filial duty, honesty, and integrity. They are said to be based on Zhu Xi's own calligraphy. In 1167, Zhu Xi visited Zhang Shi, a scholar of the Huxiang School in Tanzhou, modern-day Changsha. Their debate over a Confucian classic, The Doctrine of the Mean, set an academic precedent for such discussions. Now a part of Hunan University, the Yuelu Academy commemorated the 850th anniversary of this event in 2017. Zhu Xi was a great educator. He devoted his entire life to teaching, and he set up academies wherever he went. He believed that these were ideal institutions for the teaching and propagation of Neo-Confucianism. In 1170, Zhu Xi set up Han Chuen Lodge, a place of private study adjacent to his mother's tomb, and spent the next decade there mourning, writing, and teaching. In early 1175, Liu Tsunqian, leader of the Zhidong School, traveled from Dongyang in today's Zhejiang province to visit Zhu Xi. They lectured at Han Chuen Lodge and compiled their famous anthology, Reflections on Things at Hand. In 1180, Zhu Xi rebuilt the White Deer Grotto Academy. His regulations for this institution became an important document for Confucian education. Zhu Xi's code of conduct had a profound and lasting influence on other Confucian academies. In 1183, Zhu Xi built Woyi Lodge by the Jiuqiu River in the Woyi Mountains, northern Fujian. He studied, wrote, and lectured here. Mount Woyi became an important center of Neo-Confucianism in the south. In 1192, at Kaoting, Zhu Xi founded another institution, originally known as the Bamboo Grove Lodge. Emperor Li Tsung later granted it the name Kaoting Academy. Zhu Xi was at the height of his powers and drew scholars and students from far and wide. In his later years, Zhu Xi was accused of partisanship and dismissed from office. Yet he continued writing and teaching at the Kaoting Academy till the end. Zhu Xi was buried in Jianyang. More than a thousand people attended his funeral. His close friend, the eminent poet Xin Jiqi, wept and exclaimed, The immortal man's name lives on through the ages. Who says that you are dead? Your spirit lives still. In 1175, the Goose Lake Academy at Shangrao in modern-day Jiangxi hosted a significant event when two of the age's cultural luminaries debated each other. Zhu Xi and Lu Jiuyuan stood poles apart. Lu Jiuyuan was the most individual thinker and educated of the Southern Song. He taught that Xin, the heart-mind, was the ultimate source of everything and the basis for improving the moral and ethical agency of every person. In 1175, Zhu Xi dispatched Lu Tzu-Chien to Goose Lake Temple in Shangrao, Jiangxi. Liu would mediate between Zhu Xi and the Lu brothers, Zhou Yun and Zhou Ling, as they attempted to reconcile their differences. This meeting is known as the Goose Lake Monastery Debate. In the Erhu, 通过格物之之拘禁涵养来促进这个天理心性的显现
，而是要唤醒内心的那种天理良知。呃，如果那个东西显现了，那么一了百了，他叫发明本性，把自己的学问叫发明本性。As a leader of the Orthodox Rationalist School, Zhu Xi was concerned about Lu Jiuyun's rejection of his views. Lu drew upon Mencius' idea of original mind or innate moral agency. The highest knowledge of the Confucian Way came from inner reflection and self-education. This fundamentally challenged Confucian moral rationality, revealing great potential within Confucianism for transformation or even philosophical insurgency. This you can say is the Confucian level of two types of mentality. Some people are strong in emphasizing the human nature, the thought of the mind, the thought of the mind. Zhu Xing is recognizing the human nature. 不是说发明就行，要经过反复的功夫。Despite their differences, Zhu Xi and Lu Jiuyuan remain good friends. In 1181, Zhu invited Lu to lecture to the students at the White Deer Grotto Academy. Lu argued that what distinguished being a gentleman who knows what is right from being a mean person who looks only to his own gain was one's own determination. Everyone, including his host, was moved by this. Zhu had Lu's lecture carved in stone. This legendary philosophical event is remembered both for Lu's sincere eloquence and for Zhu's modest open-mindedness. Meanwhile, another group of scholars in Eastern Zhejiang was rising in importance. Lu Tzu-Chien, Zhu Xi, and Zheng She were dubbed the three worthies of the Southeast. Another Zhejiang native, Ye She, belonged to the Yongjia school, which advocated the utility of commerce. Eastern Zhejiang scholarship paid attention to social reality and historical experience. It formed a unique utilitarian school focused on achieving Zhejiang practical political results. Its most original thinker was Chang Liang. Chen Yang came from Yongkang County, Jinhua Prefecture. The history of Song recounts that he was born with bright eyes and grew up to be charismatic, capable, and brimming with talent. He enjoyed discussing military affairs, was sharp with his comments, and could write an article of several thousand characters with a flourish of his brush. Chen Yang and Zhu Xi often debated topics such as benevolent versus tyrannical rule, and righteousness versus material gain. The differences between the Eastern Zhejiang utilitarians and the Changzhu rationalists had a greater impact than the Goose Lake Monastery debate. Zhu Xi's approach was theoretical, emphasizing the cultivation of human nature and morality. Chen Yang's was empirical. Emphasizing the practical application of knowledge to political and economic affairs, Chen Yang retorted to his rationalist critics, "I want to be open-minded and establish a prosperous, long-lasting society." 就说他的思想代表着一些人，尤其是在南宋那种偏安之局下，他们那种试图这个呃强富国强兵那样一种倾向吧。你可以说把陈亮可以和北宋的王安石、李构，再跟这个荀子这样一个传统结合起来。他是儒家当中强调这个事功，强调事功，强调现实，强调具体性的这个思想传统。People from Eastern Zhejiang were realistic and practical. The rise of the Southern Song utilitarians. Was closely connected to local socio-economic developments and is the source of the region's modern, pragmatic, innovative, and pioneering spirit, and its commercial prosperity. However, this did not lead to modernization, or more precisely, such a process was interrupted by the Mongolian invasion. Nor did Song Neo-Confucianism strive to overthrow tradition or blaze a trail for a new social order. 
Rather, aiming to revive cultural tradition, this intellectual movement itself became a new part of ongoing tradition. In the past few years, this intellectual movement has spread as 我想他只是一个典型，一个代表，还有很多像他那样，就是有气节、非常遵守这个传统的纲常、福音传统的名教的这些诗人，所以这个前后对比是非常大的。Song Neo-Confucianism represented a significant development along the winding road from Pre-Qin philosophy via Han Confucianism, Weijin metaphysics, Suetang Buddhism. And the fluctuating fortunes of Taoism, Neo-Confucianism became the orthodoxy. It revived Confucianism by reconstructing its moral rationality and philosophical orientation. Yet the grand and innovative spirit of the Han Tang epoch had been lost. After the Song Dynasty, the patriarchal clan system and Confucian concepts, such as chastity and filial duty, became entrenched. The focus of the imperial examinations on Confucian classics and commentaries restrained intellectual creativity, impairing the pursuit of democracy and science. They maintained social stability, but at the price of long-term stagnation in Chinese society.